Heavenly Father, we're, we've been singing this morning, and in this last song, we talk about your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. You are faithful. You are kind and loving. Your most powerful acts are those of grace and mercy, forgiveness. Lord, as we continue through tumultuous times, there are people here this morning and on live stream that not only need to know but need to experience your faithfulness and your presence by the Holy Spirit at this moment. People that are struggling with families and extended families, for that loved one who is strayed, for the struggle at work or to find work, with fear that is gripping and paralyzing, we turn to you, Lord Jesus, and we ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would do battle in the spiritual realm, that you would fend off the attacks of the enemy, that you would silence the lies, and that your love, your perfect love, would displace fear. And that you would continue to reach out to that son or daughter, that brother, sister, father, uncle, or aunt, because you are faithful. And as good as we have it here and as thankful as we are of the groceries and the medical care and the incomes and the roof over our heads, we know all of it is frail, faulty, and often failing. And so we need and we turn to our rock, the rock of our salvation, which is you, Lord Jesus. There is no other foundation which we can build our life and our faith. So Holy Spirit, have your way among us even here now this morning. Move among us. Glorify yourself in our midst. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, music team, uh, for your uh, ministry again this morning. The Kleenex industry is alive and thriving because of you. Uh, I, have, I have to first make a, a comment correction from last week. Uh, last week, I said that uh, Tyler and I both enjoyed dark roast coffee. So I have a correction to make. See, I equate dark roast with good coffee. Um, what I meant to say was Tyler and I both really appreciate good coffee. Okay? Uh, and so actually out of that, because he, he doesn't really necessarily like dark roast coffee, okay? Uh, but out of that it came, uh, what was revealed was again my coffee bias that I didn't know I had, but I was equating good with dark roast, and that's not necessarily the case. It's just the case with me. All right, so I, I feel like I've, I've gotten uh, over that, um, so that's good. The next thing I wanted to mention was that uh, last Sunday, uh, we preached uh, a sermon on, or I preached on, uh, unity. At Westview, we... Envision Westview to be united. We envision Westview to be a diverse people with a deep sense of belonging, united in God's love. And we had some good questions that came out during the morning, and uh, a few questions were submitted to us subsequently uh, on this subject. And uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, but I want to give you one more specific example of this, and that is in our context that we are in this COVID context. And we know that uh, in this COVID context, there's a variety of different uh, views and perspectives. But I want to speak specifically now about masks is one part, but then there's also the subject of vaccines. 
And we know that there are different perspectives and views on wearing a mask, and there are also different views or perspectives on taking this vaccine. Now, taking a vaccine and a view on that is different than a mask because it is more intrusive. It's actually taking a needle and taking some drug into your system. So it's a little different than a mask is. So there are these different views and different perspectives in our congregation and in your families and in your workplaces and in our communities. But I want to speak specifically to followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus. There is no room for calling names or insulting, denigrating, or putting somebody down regardless of their view. There's no room for it. It makes no sense if we are followers of Jesus. We've talked uh, since I got here about a ministry of COVID carefulness. A care because we believe, like Jesus said, I, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. Paul then says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to talk about the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if that is our posture, then we are concerned for each and every person regardless of their particular view or opinion. We may disagree. It's actually okay to disagree but to also do that in love. This is an opportunity for followers of Jesus to be uniquely different than the world. Because in our world, in the circumstance and context that we're in, as I said last Sunday, the world is pushing towards polarization. Remember who the enemy is and who he is not. The world wants to push towards polarization and get sides. Us, them, as I talked about last week. But followers of Jesus, we have another way. We have the Jesus way. And as we talked about uh, already about reconciliation, and we're going to hear more about it this morning, reconciliation is a way to find of coming together. It's invitational. Jesus does not coerce or force. The biggest decision that we will make in our lives is whether or not to follow Jesus. And he doesn't force anybody. In fact, we even use the word decision. And so we want to come alongside and understand and respect the decisions of different people so we can pray and we can actually slow down and seek to understand. The reason I mention that again here this morning is because next Sunday is communion. Communion. Where we share the bread and the juice, the cup together. And so I want to invite you, if you're listening on live stream or here this morning, What's important about communion is that we can take communion together and be reconciled together. So that means if you know of somebody and you've, uh, uh, that someone has uh, an issue with you or a concern with you, Jesus says in Matthew 5, actually, leave your offering at the altar and go and be reconciled with that person. He actually says, if you know someone has got an issue with you, don't even come to church. Go and first be reconciled with that person before you come back to church, Matthew 5. Then he says, look, if you have an issue with somebody else in Matthew 18, he says, go and talk to that person directly and come to a reconciliation. So before next Sunday's communion, if you know someone has some concerns with you, or if you have some concerns with somebody else, you don't have to agree. But let's make sure we're in a relationship where we can share communion together in any case. All right. Well, now let's get to the sermon. Yeah, getting started. It's unfortunate that we've kind of locked us into uh, one-hour time frames, but anyway, be that <laughs> as it may. Uh, worship. Speaking of controversial subjects, we gather together in person like this or on live stream for what we call a worship service. Well, what really is worship all about? What comes to mind when you hear the word worship? What are some essentials for worship? What, what would you call some of the essentials? Another question would be, what constraints do you feel to having the freedom in worship? 
I invite you, if you have a, a paper and a pen there, you can write a few notes down or take out your phones and write a few notes down of some words or ideas that come to mind when you think about worship. What's it, what is it? Jesus talks about true worship as opposed to false worship. So what is true worship? He actually settled it in his day. He was quite direct about it. He settled it in his day and from then on. I invite you to turn with me to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. John chapter 4. Jesus was with his disciples. They went on ahead to town to uh, find something to eat and drink. Jesus stayed behind. He found himself hanging out at a well. And while he was there, a woman, a Samaritan woman came to get some water. John chapter 4, verse 7. A Samaritan woman, I'm going to call her Samira. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. So when she, Jesus is talking with the woman, she begins, as he asks the first question, she begins by appealing to the differences that she has with Jesus. She appeals to the differences and that those differences are what creates the division. The first thing she appeals to is ethnic uh, d difference. I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew. Ethnic difference, so division. In other words, we don't have anything in common. She even appeals to gender difference. How is it? Like, I'm a woman and you're a man. I'm a woman Samaritan and you're a male Jew. Appealing to differences that have now been established that create this division. We go on in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. There's even a socioeconomic difference here. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi, and this woman, as we're discovering and Jesus knew, had been married and divorced five times. And now she's living in what we today would call common law. She's living with a sixth guy, and they're not married. So socially, mainstream speaking, there's a lot of differences here that have created a lot of division. But here comes the turn. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. So, you know, Samira, now Jesus knows her. And she feels seen because he said, you've, got five, you've had five husbands and now you're living with a sixth. And what she does is, again, she turns the tables back to Jesus. She's still on this thing about divide, and difference, and separation. 
And now she's appealing to tradition. Well, you Jews, can you hear that language? Right? It's not, we have, that is happening today, but it was happening 2,000 years ago. Human nature. And she goes, you Jews, you worship this way and you say this place is important. And us Samaritans, or we worship this way and this way is important and this place is important. And there's all this division and it, now it's having to do with the tradition of worship. And even the place of worship. And this is really what amounts to what today could be called religion. Religion, this, these, when we have these traditions and we have rituals and we have ideas that are essentially empty or based on something where we are against. When we have doctrines or distinctives that are actually empty, when they're based on what we're against, they become empty and they become a form of religion. It's kind of like this. If we believe that um, it starts out with we believe in... Uh, life, the importance and value of life. That turns into we are against abortion and from there it moves to being violent against abortion clinic. That's religion. It has moved from, yes, we believe in the value of life and it just morphs into this other thing and it becomes in what is called an ideology, fanaticism. And what is happening here is this religion that is taking place, that Jesus sees. So what in the world is worship? Well, today in our context, there's a spectrum. I was showing uh, Reese one of my books uh, on, on worship. I have s- books uh, on it. I, I, I took several courses on it. I was a part-time minister in uh, Mississauga, Ontario, I- in worship. I showed him some of my books, and he goes, oh, but dude, that's already outdated. What year was it? And I'm like, well, yeah, maybe 10 years ago. But the spectrum, they just keep changing. But certain words and certain things come to mind when we think about worship. And what's interesting to me is that uh, the, the idea of music is almost synonymous with worship. We almost equate the two the same. I've actually heard pastors say, and now we're going to do a bit of worship. That, like that phrase. In other words, the music team's going to come up and they're going to do a song or two. But we also have traditions here at Westview certain ways that we, when we get together for a worship service. And it's true, different ethnicities have different ways of worshiping. Kimberly and I have been fortunate to travel to many countries and visit with many people in different places. When we're in a mountain village in in Mexico, they they worship a certain way. When we go to visit our friends in Kinshasa, Congo, they worship a certain way. So what is essential to worship? What is really essential? Well, place as this Samira and Jesus were talking about, place is really important. Location, place. It's vital and important, and it has a big impact. It's interesting to me that Jesus and Samira were, they met at a well. They met at a well. The well, this place which is recognized as a source for sustenance, a source of of life. For thousands of years, people gathered around wells. But the, a place is such a big impact and so influential. Let me give you an example. If you were in a place like this, uh, we'll put up that first one there. What, is, what kind of place is this? Anybody? Library. It's a library. So when you're in a place like this, you conduct yourself a certain way, right? If you're in a library, kids... You kind of, what, what do you have to do if you're in a library? You have to be quiet. Like as if. What if you're in a place like this, this next one? What, what is that? Right? What is that? Football, stadium. And when you're in this place, you could be loud. Just changing places. And then there's a place like this. This is near, in the neighborhood where Kimberly and I live. It's along a path by trees. There's a little ways over here. You'd hear water trickling. When you're in a place like this, what does that do? Solitude. You get started thinking and reflective. So place 
has a profound impact in, in the way we conduct ourselves, in our behavior. What's interesting to me is that when the church of Jesus Christ began and to flourish, they met in people's homes, but over the centuries, their trajectory became one of institutionalizing the whole experience of followers of Jesus coming together, and they started building monuments and big places. You know, the idea of megachurch? Megachurch isn't new. Megachurch has been around for a long time. One of the things Kimberly and I like to do when we travel abroad is we like to go to different churches to get a sense of so like studying the culture and the context. This is an example of one of the churches that we were at. This is called Sagrada Familia. This is in Barcelona. What's interesting is uh, Kimberly and I were at Moraine Lake and we noticed some of the rock formation and this reminded me, uh, uh, the, the rock formation almost reminded me a little bit of this Sagrada Familia, some, a, a mammoth church. Here's another picture of another church. Santa Cruz in uh, Firenze in Florence. Beautiful, big church when we were by there. The interesting thing is that there's not a lot of people going there on Sunday morning. And then there's this church. This is called the Duomo. When Kimberly and I were staying in Florence, uh, for my sabbatical, we were close to this place. We would go there like a five-minute walk. We'd go there a lot. But again, there's not a lot of people going there on Sunday morning. There's not a lot of actual services happening inside this church. In fact, they've got to do a lot of things in order to keep up the building and the facade. Massive churches. Institutionalizing Christianity. And you say, well, Gary, that isn't necessarily the case today. Well, Actually, it is. We have, even recently, the government in some of the new uh, uh, communications that they put out, they put out a special heading, and that special heading related to people that are followers of Jesus or, or religious people, that special heading is called Places of Worship. And what they mean is really buildings. So we've equated, in one sense, music in worship, and now we've equated, uh, through the centuries, we've equated the building in worship, places of worship. And so when a COVID pandemic comes along in 2020, people can even be heard saying, the church is closed. But the church isn't closed. <laughs> Maybe the building, we're not coming into the building, but the church isn't closed, but we have been so uh, enculturated with some of these synonyms and some of these ways of thinking that now we're actually have moved over. Oh, then there's the problem of crowds, of assembling together. See, when we get together, it's wonderful and we love seeing each other, but then there, the other problem is that we feel kind of like there's this social contract, like we have to behave a certain way, you know? I don't know how many times, in, and I've preached in, in many places in Canada and other places, and I don't know how many times someone has come up to me after a, a service, a worship service, and they've said, oh, Gary, you know what? I really wanted to say amen. Oh, Gary, I really wanted to say hallelujah, but I didn't. I wanted to, but I didn't. They felt like they had to kind of behave. I've had other friends of mine, people that I know, come up to me after service and say, you know what? Like, I just, I was feeling like, down. I was feeling like a grief and sadness, and I, I just wanted to be here, and I wanted to be among the people, but I felt like I, I didn't fit in because everybody else seemed so happy. That's the problem with crowds and assembling and coming together is because sometimes we feel constrained and we feel like we're not allowed to say hallelujah when we feel like it. And sometimes we feel like we're not allowed to grieve when we feel like it. And in either case, is it real or is it fake? And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says true worship and true worshipers because it is specific and there's something specific about it and the order is really important and what Jesus is really pointing out is if it's not real and it's not true then what it is is fake and false and really youth and children and young adults they understand when something isn't real and true they pick it up 
And I think us adults kind of get it too. We feel it too. And we actually yearn for real and true and not fake and false. So what is true worship? Jesus goes on in verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, (laughs) believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You will worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. This is the way of Jesus. It is a way of reconciliation, a way to reconcile. And what He does is He opens up space. This would be a great... Um, this passage is an excellent passage in how to have a conversation because he opens up space. He does not judge this woman who has been married five times and is now living common law with the sixth guy. He doesn't judge her. He doesn't call her names. He doesn't castigate or denigrate in any way. But he also doesn't allow for um, excuse for division or separation either. That the differences are, oh yeah, that's true. We better not. We better stay apart. He doesn't allow for that either. Because the exercise for Jesus is not one of trying to win an argument or trying to be right. The first objective is not trying to be right and point out the other person is wrong. What he's doing is he's describing a way that the world is. And he's describing the character and nature of God and the way the world is. And he's inviting this woman into that reality, into the way the world is and the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he asks questions. And he opens up the space. And then she starts asking questions. And rather than division, she leans in. And he says, it's about time. And he says, it's about time, meaning worship in this case is about time. And what he says is the time is coming and is now here. Because in the reality of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ came to earth and his resurrection and ascension, he initiated a new and different way to live. And a new and different way to worship. He initiated a new and different way to live and worship that is now here as well in 2021. And that way, that manner... He talks about, he uses this word true, which means genuine or honest, transparent, it's real. And that manner he talks about is spirit and truth, spirit and truth. And these are kind of this phrase, these are shorthand phrases already because what we hear in John is, at the beginning of John, he says, Jesus came in grace and truth. And we start hearing that Jesus and this spirit and truth are very similar. And then we also hear as we go on in the gospel of John, that John describes the Holy Spirit as spirit and truth, the spirit of truth. So actually the place the Samira is talking about, and she's so hung up on the mountain or the location and the tradition, and Jesus is saying the idea of place, you're not so far off. But Jesus, who at the beginning of the Gospel of John says, I'm the temple, I'm the tabernacle, I'm the synagogue. And then he starts saying, well, maybe, you know, the mountain is the place. Well, I represent that. But then he goes on and he says, you know, the the Gospel writers talk about the fact that we access God the Spirit through Jesus the Son. That we have access to Him because of Jesus the Son. But it's through the Holy Spirit, primarily, that we 
are enabled, empowered to worship. It's through the Spirit that we cry, Abba, Father. It's through the Holy Spirit that we worship the Spirit of God and boast in Jesus Christ. He is called the Spirit of truth who guides and leads. So the place of worship is the Holy Spirit. And just like last week, we talked about the Trinity of being three in one, and it kind of messes with our math. Well, now we're messing with your sense of location because it isn't building. It's a person. It's a holy person called the Holy Spirit. And what he's saying is the place of worship is the location is the Holy Spirit. The who is the where. You know that there is a force on this platform right now. There's something happening on this platform right now. You can't see it. You can't hear it. But there's something going on on this platform right now. Just a chapter earlier, Jesus was describing the Holy Spirit. And he called the Holy Spirit something like wind. Numa. Hagias Numa. Numa means wind. It also means breath. It means spirit. All of that wrapped together. And he was explaining that the Holy Spirit is like, it's, you can't see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. There is something going on in this platform right now. You can't see it, but it's here, and I can demonstrate it just by doing this. Oh, well, maybe, maybe you can. What in the world? You can't see it, but you can see the effects of it. And that is, that is what Jesus is talking about, is the Holy Spirit. This isn't the Holy Spirit, by the way. But it could be, right? Right? We can see the effects. And what Jesus is saying is when we worship, we aren't locked into a place. What he says is stand in the holy wind and breath of the Holy Spirit. Locate yourself in the Holy Spirit. Start there. It's interesting to me that John uses two different metaphors to describe the Holy Spirit. He says it is like holy wind and breath, and he says the Holy Spirit is like water, living water. The two things that human beings need that we cannot live without. Grace, you're a nurse. You know this so, so well. We can survive for quite a few days without food, but we don't last that long without water. And we sure don't last more than a handful of minutes without air. And just like our physical bodies need air and water, so too the body of Christ, the church, and the followers of Jesus Christ, we are animated, we are alive and given life, we are born again, as John says, through the work of the Holy Spirit, and we are kept alive, and we worship by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit like we need air and water. We envision Westview to be abiding in the Spirit, transformed in worship. Abiding in the Spirit, transformed in worship. And what that means is transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can transform a person's abilities and skills because the Holy Spirit is the one that grants what is called the fruit of the Spirit, grants virtues to us like love, joy, and peace. The Holy Spirit grants patience and kindness and goodness, 
gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These things that we need the Holy Spirit for. The Holy Spirit transforms our lives and gives us uh, uh, spiritual gifts. Jesus himself, fully God and fully man, was radically open to the work of the Holy Spirit. When he came into the synagogue and they asked him to preach, he took the scroll from Isaiah and he unrolled it to a very specific passage. In the prophet of Isaiah, he unrolled it to this passage and we read in Luke 4, he began to read and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus said, the Spirit is upon me. The Spirit is upon me. The Spirit is upon me. We see it over and over again. We need the Holy Spirit. He is the location of our worship. We envision being abiding in the Spirit, being transformed in worship. We need the Holy Spirit. And we can certainly join with the, the saints because the worship is not constrained to a location. It's con- it, it's, it's based on a person, on a holy person. So we can worship whether you're together as a group around a table, whether you're in the library, whether you're out on that walk, whether you are at the grocery store or wherever you are, put yourself in the, in the holy, holy wind, in the breath, in the air of the Lord Jesus Christ and go ahead and worship. Abide in the Spirit. And friends, we will join with the saints of the last thousands of years. They didn't know even that they were abiding in the Spirit when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and they made it safely to the other side. They spontaneously erupted in music and dancing. Cymbals and tambourines and they broke it out. David, David, Musician, poet, singer, dancer, Mary and Elizabeth, Zechariah. Abiding in the Spirit, transformed in worship. I'm going to pause for a a, a moment here. I'm going to ask the music team to come forward. And while they are, I'm going to just pause for a a brief moment of Q&R. If you have a question... Uh, that you want to send, you can email or text to ask at westviewchurch.ca. Text or email ask at westviewchurch.ca. Or you can stand and raise your hand and we'll uh, take your question and see if you have uh, some questions. T.Y., have you got anything uh, on the, uh, in the, in the box, in the inbox? Yeah, our apologies for last week. Some of these go to junk, and so we're a little bit more proactive now at recognizing that we're not treating you like junk. Uh, that's just simply a, uh, a reality, and so uh, that's... That's our, our email problem. That's, that's my problem, not you. It's me, not you. Yeah, one thing. No, I'm going to leave it on. Thanks, Ree. Uh, uh, when we talk about worship services, why are some so somber and reserved in some churches where others seem to be more like a dance party? Is one more right? Is one more spirit and truth filled? Is this something about reverence? Right, right. Yeah, that's good. So why are there different service types or why is there a different vibe to a worship service? Some are like a dance party and some are more somber and so on, right? Okay, yeah, that's good. And and we recognize that. And there are differences and differences are good. And again, the, what, what Jesus was saying is true worshipers, worshiping in spirit and truth. That word truth is genuine or honest. And so if when we gather together and it is, it, it, you're, you're honestly just joyful and you're moving or you're dancing, or you're clapping and that's honest, then that is, that, is seek, that is what the Lord talks about, spirit and truth. And if you have had a lot of difficulty, you've lost your spouse and you've come to the worship service and you don't feel like dancing or clapping. In fact, you feel like just bending over, letting this music happen and you being like this. And there are some cases where that's happening too and it's somber and that's truthful and it's spirit and truth. The issue lies when we force or cajole a certain vibe like you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way and that's why 
Jesus is saying the location is the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide and influence and shape the way we go about doing this. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap it up here. I want to give us a couple of practical things. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, like Paul writes in Romans 12, present ourselves to the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Present yourselves to God, which is your spiritual form of worship, Romans 12. So present ourselves and say, here, Lord, here I am. And, and Holy Spirit, I put, my, myself, I, I put myself in, in, in front of you. I locate myself in the Spirit. When I'm waking up in the morning and I swivel and I put my feet on the ground and say, Holy Spirit, here I am. It's like Samuel, Lord, here I am. And the second after present yourselves is ask. Ask the Lord. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. Ask, Holy Spirit, help me, guide me, shape me. Let's ask him for his movement, his will to be done in our midst, wherever that midst is, wherever we gather. And then follow through actually walk in step with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is con convicting you or guiding you or speaking to you saying, hey, you know what, call this person and tell them you're praying for them. Uh, when you see this person, just give them a word of encouragement. You know what, you feel like saying hallelujah, the Holy Spirit says, say hallelujah. Like, no, I'm going to argue with the Holy Spirit. Just follow through. And you know what, maybe sometimes you'll get it wrong, but if your heart is there, the Lord sees your heart, and if your heart is there and you're desiring to walk and step with the Holy Spirit, then we know the Lord is faithful, and if you get it wrong, just try again, but follow through on the conviction and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and then believe. Paul writes in Galatians, listen, we, we came to faith through the work of the Holy Spirit. We were born through the work of the Holy Spirit, are we going to continue now to live by the flesh or are we going to continue to live by the Holy Spirit? So believe, believe that the Holy Spirit is desire and will is to fuel and support and be involved in our worship in our daily lives. And friends, the Holy Spirit is here. Quite often when we're singing, I'm praying to the Lord and saying, Holy Spirit, your will be done in this place because I know His will is so wonderful. I know his will is so good. And I want his will to be done in your lives, in your family's lives, in all of our lives, in our communities. For those people that are not yet followers of Jesus, I want the Holy Spirit's will to be done in their lives too. Imagine, Westview, abiding in the Spirit and then being transformed in worship.